So it's with great pleasure that I invite Dr. Tim Sudpamasan to give the keynote address. Well, thanks very much for that introduction, Vice Chancellor, and I'm indeed looking forward to returning to UWS very shortly. UWS has been a powerhouse when it comes to cultural diversity, and as a boy from southwest Sydney, uh, uh, it gives me a lot of heart uh, to, to see the university leading the way. Uh, I also welcome your remarks, Vice-Chancellor, on the importance of the humanities, particularly given the, the challenge of engaging with an Asian century. As I've said on other occasions, quite often when Australia talks about engaging with our neighbours in Asia, it's done in highly mercenary or mercantilist terms. We cannot instrumentalise the relationship we have with our neighbours. That way we need to think about how we can contribute to the region as much as what we can extract from or extract for, as you might say, uh, the, the region. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the, the Darug people, and, uh, and, and thank Rick for, uh, well, he's not here, but thank, thank him for his welcome to country. This being NAIDOC week, it's important that we reflect on the contribution of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures, uh, cultures which are the oldest uh, enduring cultures in the world, and, uh, and it's, it's an occasion for us to think about how we can do better as well, not least in recognising Australia's first peoples in our constitution. Uh, I also acknowledge uh, Dean Hutchings uh, and uh, Anne Rutherford, who's, uh, uh, and, and, the, and the committee uh, of, of the conference for putting this together. When I think back to my days as a research uh, student, I wish I had uh, taken more opportunities to, to attend conferences and, and learn from my um, peers, but you live in you learn, so I hope that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, those postgraduate students uh, here make the most of the next few days. And it does look like a fascinating program, and I'm intrigued by the theme of interventions and intersections. Uh, I'd like to address my remarks today to the threats that exist to racial tolerance in Australia and some emerging challenges in combating racial discrimination, uh, but I'll, I'll do it uh, to some degree through the lens of interventions and uh, intersections, uh, because combating racial prejudice and discrimination does require interventions from uh, citizens, whether through conversations or through other means. And there's intersection, at least for me, uh, uh, with the ideas that I've pursued in the past in my research in political philosophy. Uh, now, I uh, have a background in, in thinking about questions of national identity and citizenship, and uh, I'll take the, the occasion to, to reflect a little on, on how that thinking uh, shapes my, my work as, as race discrimination uh, commissioner. So I'll, I'll begin on, on, on that note of, of intersection and say a little about uh, say a little about the concept of, of patriotism and a love of country. Uh, you may not think that this has uh, an obvious connection to combating racial discrimination, not least because for many people patriotism may be a byword or a synonym for jingoism, a way for people to uh, express forms of prejudice or discrimination. But very briefly, I'd like to recapitulate some of the the, the arguments in favour of considering patriotism not in a pathological way but as, as something that can motivate and animate our thinking about diversity and human rights. And the place to start is to, to ask what does it actually mean to love your country? And that's essentially what, what patriotism means. For many, a love of country means a, an absolute devotion to your country, a, blind form of loyalty, something that requires you never to question your allegiance or your belonging to a nation. Uh, I take a different approach. Namely, if you are to, to love something, make something the, the object of your devotion, affection and allegiance, I believe you also have an obligation to do your best to improve that object. And so it is for, for your country. If you are someone who is dedicated 
to your community, who loves your country, then you'll want to see your country do better. And sometimes that will mean criticising your country if it were to fall short of some standards that it should live up to. Here are the lodestar for, for, for me is a figure in the name of Karl Schurz, who was a German-American politician in the 19th century. He was the senator for Missouri and was the first American senator to have been foreign-born. At the time that he sat in that august institution, the various German states were beginning to, to come together in the, the form of a unified empire. And so there was animated debate on the floor of the Senate, and some of Karl Schurz's colleagues, indeed critics or opponents in the Senate, accused him of being disloyal. How could Karl Schurz be loyal to America, it was asked, if he were German, if his allegiance were divided between Germany and America? And at one point during an extended debate on the floor of the Senate, one of his opponents said, my country right or wrong. You'll be familiar with that phrase as it's often invoked with patriotism. Karl Schurz offered a riposte. He said, yes, my country right or wrong, when right to be kept right, when wrong to be set right. For me, that captures what a genuine patriotism should be about. Uh, when you, you subscribe to a national identity or to a community, you belong to a certain tradition. But a tradition involves standards. If those standards are not met, then a member of that tradition is obligated to make sure that that tradition is restored. I first really began thinking about uh, patriotism as, as, a, as a teenager at, at Hurlston Agricultural uh, High School uh, in Glenfield, not far from here. For those of you who are familiar uh, with, with Hurlston, you, you may be aware that the motto of the school is Pro Patria, or For My Country, uh, taken from uh, those words of Horace, of course. Um, Il duce decorum est pro patria mori. There's nothing sweeter and more fitting than to die for my country. Uh, this was an ethos that was inculcated for us through the celebration of our most famous old boy, John Edmondson, V.C., the first Australian to win a Victoria Cross in the Second World War. Uh, Corporal Edmondson was cut down by a hail of machine gun fire uh, from Germans in Tobruk. I remember first thinking about patriotism during an Anzac Day ceremony that we had at the school and we took our Anzac Day ceremonies pretty seriously. Uh, but I remember a student, a fellow student, uh, she must only have been a year older th than I was at the time, uh, saying that Anzac Day was a day that we should pause and reflect to remember the sacrifices that our forebears had made so that we could enjoy the Australian way of life. I remember thinking about those words and recognising the nobility of the sentiment. Of course it was noble. And yet there was something about the words chosen that didn't quite sound right to me. Uh, and it was because the person saying those words was a person like me. And by like me, I mean someone who was of an Asian a cultural background, and hearing her refer to our forebears, her forebears, or my forebears, uh, just wasn't right. Uh, and it wasn't right because I was a student of history, and I knew very well that at the time that Australia participated in the First World War, there may well have been many of, uh, of, of those signing up who may have chosen to, to fight precisely because they were motivated by a desire to keep out my forebears and the forebears of my fellow Asian Australian. And that was the first time when I had to, to, to challenge myself to think about how I could belong to an Australian tradition if that historical tradition may not always have left room for, for me or, or, or my forebears. Uh, in time, I've come to 
accept uh, Anzac uh, Day as, as an important and integral part of the Australian national identity. And a few years ago, I, I went back to, to Helston uh, Ag and actually gave a, an oration on, on Anzac, on the Anzac Day uh, commemoration there. And I, I said to, to the students that perhaps my response those years ago may have been different if I had heard uh, people uh, tell the story not only of, of John Edmondson VC but also stories such as uh, such as those of Billy Singh, uh, a Chinese, uh, part, part Chinese um, Australian digger who served with distinction during the First World War, or if I'd heard stories about Jack Wong Su, someone who served in a special uh, Z unit and infiltrated Japanese enemy lines in Borneo and subsequently would lead Anzac Day marches in Perth, a Chinese uh, Australian who, when he initially attempted to enlist for the Second World War, was rejected. Uh, he believed because of his race. Uh, he had, uh, he had uh, attempted to, uh, I believe, enlist in, uh, in the Navy, got rejected and then enlisted again. If I had heard those stories involving Billy Singh and Jack Wong Su, then perhaps I would have had a different uh, response uh, to, to the Anzac tradition when I was uh, a teenager, uh, but as I, as I said to the students, the importance of commemorating uh, Anzac uh, is, is one that takes on a number of dimensions. For many Australians, of course, it will involve an ancestral element, uh, but for those of us who cannot claim a direct ancestral lineage to the tradition, uh, there is nonetheless a connection there, given the sacrifices that our fellow citizens past and present have made and make. I hope that gives you some sense of, of where my, my thinking of, uh, of patriotism uh, has, has, has led me. Uh, but it wasn't until 2005 that my, my, my thinking on, on patriotism began to crystallise. And again, it was prompted by uh, an encounter. And the encounter was uh, that of watching the Cronulla riot unfold uh, when I was uh, in England at the time, and I remember watching scenes of what happened that uh, Saturday in December 2005 on Cronulla Beach, and feeling that I had lost something uh, that day, that I felt that I had been uh, severed in a very dramatic way from, from my country. Uh, and I decided then that, uh, that uh, I would pursue as as the topic of, of my research um, as, a, as a doctoral uh, student, uh, the, the question of patriotism and national culture. Because what I saw in Cronulla uh, that day, the, the flag-waving display of jingoism, the exclusion that was directed at those of Middle Eastern background was not the kind of patriotism that I, I, I thought we should be. Uh, endorsing. That was precisely the kind of ugly patriotism that we should be rejecting. Um, and it was important, in my view, that those who had a small L liberal or, or generous love of country actually made the argument for reclaiming uh, the, the sentiment of patriotism. Multiculturalism has also been, been a major part of, of, of my thinking in, in, in the past. In, in political theory, and I've been of the view that we have an Australian model of multiculturalism that is exceptional. Exceptional in a number of ways. Exceptional in that it has stood separately from the experience of multiculturalism in other countries, and I'm thinking here in particular of Europe. But also exceptional in the success that we have had in achieving social cohesion and nation building in the face of cultural diversity. The facts on Australia's multiculturalism are pretty unambiguous, at least in my opinion. When post-war migration began in Australia in, in 1947, we were a country whose composition was more than 90% anglo 
Celtic. If you look at the composition of Australia's population today, you will find a population where more than a quarter was born overseas, where a further 20% have a parent who was born overseas. That's close to half the population being either first or second generation Australian. And 20% of our population speak an English or a language other than English at home. If you think of how this has evolved, if you think of how from a, a country of only a, a, a few million, six or seven million in, in 1947, and the intake of at least a million migrants in each subsequent decade, first from Europe, subsequently from other parts of the world, and you think of how social stability has been maintained, then I think it's a remarkable record. Now, compare our experience with, with others who have had to encounter mass immigration. If you think about the experience in Britain, for example, uh, at the top, off the top of my head I can think of a number of major race riots that have happened periodically. You can think of Notting Hill, you can think of St Paul's, you can think of Brixton. If you think of the experience of a country such as France, uh, you think of what happened in 2000 and, um, and, and in 2004 or 5 when there was major civil unrest where a state of national emergency was declared in more than 200 cities. If you think about a country such as Germany, which has had to deal with millions uh, of, of migrants, mainly taken through their guest worker program historically, uh, you think of a uh, historically disadvantaged groups of people who haven't been able to claim formal membership of the German nation, at least until about a decade ago. It was the case in Germany that you had to uh, trace your lineage back to a grandparent who was by blood German. If you put us into to that context, uh, you, you begin to appreciate uh, just how distinctive the Australian experience has been. Uh, but on the counts of social cohesion, on the counts of economic and educational participation, on the counts of civic integration, the report card is a phenomenal one. The children of migrants in Australia today, in fact, outperform the children of native-born Australians when it comes to education and when it comes to employment outcomes. Uh, you don't get that sort of result in many countries that have significant immigrant intakes. And if you look at civic integration, you find as well that about 80% of immigrants who permanently settle in Australia within 10 years take out Australian citizenship. Uh, that's a ringing endorsement of the sort of process that has taken place. And the process I'm referring to is the process of, of citizenship. Uh, this has been the, the fundamental principle of Australian multicultural policy. When Al Grasby first used the word multicultural in 1973, he referred to a multicultural Australia as enlarging the family of the nation. This is a very important point. Multiculturalism in Australia was never meant to supersede an Australian national identity. Rather, it was an expression of Australian national identity. The central idea has been that there's no one authoritative way that you can be Australian. You can be Australian in more than one way. And if you look at the formal articulation of multiculturalism, you will find that it's been codified in terms of citizenship. Namely, every Australian should have the right to express their cultural identity and heritage, but that is also accompanied by a responsibility to adhere to parliamentary democracy, the rule of law, respect equality of the, sec uh, equality of the sexes, freedom of religion and freedom of speech. There's been a social compact at the heart of Australian multiculturalism. Unfortunately, this isn't always appreciated in the public commentary that we enjoy on multiculturalism. 
Thus, there are always people who will say multiculturalism must mean cultural relativism. It must mean endorsing every culture as being equal and, and valid, uh, that everything goes, that there are no limits to diversity. Uh, I think it's telling that whenever critics of multiculturalism raise the spectre of cultural relativism, the examples they draw are very rarely Australian in nature. They may point to the recognition of certain illiberal practices in another country, but very rarely can it be demonstrated that in the Australian experience there has been cultural relativism in practice and for the very simple reason that it just doesn't exist. Let me say a little now about deliberation. This is another uh, part of, uh, part of the, my, my, my former research which, uh, which still uh, animates my, my thinking and work today. Now, I'm a believer in having a public culture that is deliberative in character. Some will think of democracy as about the negotiation of interests or in terms of bargaining between groups uh, or a form of majoritarian democracy where the will of the majority should prevail over the minority through an established procedure of democracy. Uh, my view is that a, a liberal democracy, and that's what uh, we, we, we have here, uh, should be guided by, by, by something more than that. Uh, it's important that citizens are able to exchange ideas in the public sphere with mutual respect and with publicity, that people can hold their elected representatives and their fellow citizens to account, that they can engage in good faith, uh, provide reasons for their positions. Uh, this is as much an ideal and an aspiration as it is a reality. Of course, we don't always live up to the requirements of deliberative democracy, but nonetheless, it's an important uh, value that we must uh, assert uh, in, in our public discussions of various issues. Uh, when it concerns issues such as climate change or asylum uh, seekers uh, or, or other contentious issues, um, I, I think we can do with more deliberation than with less. So let me try and be a bit more explicit about the intersections now between these uh, background ideas or, or, uh, or, or academic uh, concepts in, in political theory and, and my current work uh, in the area of race discrimination and, and human rights. Uh, deliberation, I think, is indeed key for the very simple that uh, combating racial discrimination must involve conversations. It must involve an attempt to change people's minds. Uh, and it's my thinking that we can, uh, we can only do that uh, uh, by taking reason and evidence seriously in the first place. But it can't just be confined to reason and evidence alone. You cannot change hearts and minds through technocratic reason, unfortunately. Um, and that's why I think something like patriotism can in fact be a powerful tool in combating racism. Because what happens uh, when, when you have racism in a society? Uh, what is the cost of racial prejudice and discrimination? In very simple terms, it's my view that what you are seeing is you are seeing something that diminishes the potential of a person and a fellow citizen. When you have racism and a denial of respect and dignity, what, you can, end up what can end up happening is a country failing to live up to its full potential. Uh, combating racism, in my view, therefore, is a very, can be a very patriotic uh, thing. Uh, racism, far from uh, being patriotic, is in fact something that harms the nation and is deeply unpatriotic. There's something now to be said about interventions on racism and, and prejudice. Uh, I refer to the 
archetypical situation of the bystander uh, intervention. Uh, now, there's a genre of racism in contemporary Australian society with which you'll be familiar. We, in fact, saw a, a very powerful illustration of this genre last week uh, on a train here in Sydney that was uh, on its way to Newcastle. Uh, I'll presume that you all know what I'm talking about. If you've been uh, following the news, you will have seen a, a woman initially identified as Sue Wilkins. Uh, turns out her name is Karen Bailey. Uh, abusing some fellow passengers in her train carriage after she was denied a, a, a seat in the carriage. And when she began phoning police, a male passenger on this carriage began filming her on his mobile phone. He was sitting next to a woman of Asian extraction. Uh, and during her uh, tirade against her fellow passengers, once she caught sight of this, woman of Asian extraction, uh, she launched into a series of racial epithets uh, against this woman. But we've seen this in other settings as well. Uh, we've seen it on buses. We, we've seen it, for example, in that case in 2012 where a French-speaking woman was with a group of friends singing the Marseillaise, only to be threatened by a fellow passenger that she should speak English or die. Uh, we saw that fellow passenger smashing the glass of, of that bus. Uh, we're, we're familiar too with stories such as the one involving the ABC News reader Jeremy Fernandez when he encountered uh, something similar. So this is a, a, a genre, uh, but it's uh, something that happens quite frequently. It's not un common. And you may be surprised at the prevalence of racism in Australian society today. This is one of the paradoxes of our multicultural experience. For all the success that we have, as a multicultural society, racism unfortunately still endures and is still a significant phenomenon. About 20% of our population say that they have been subjected to racial verbal abuse. About 5% say that they've been subjected to physical assault because of their race. And if you look at the social science research and evidence on this, there are signs that this has been increasing. So the Scanlon Foundation, which conducts an annual study into social cohesion and has done so since 2007, uh, has typically found that... Uh, 10 to 12 percent of their respondents in this national survey report that they've experienced racial or religious discrimination at some point during the past 12 months. Well, last year, the Scanlon Foundation found this figure to be 19 percent. Uh, we haven't had such a significant jump previously uh, during the lifetime of this survey. It's a sign, I believe, uh, that we, we cannot be complacent about this. At the same time, we must recognise the immense challenge of intervening in situations of racism. If you have witnessed a situation of racial abuse and harassment, uh, you will know what I'm talking about. Uh, you may be sitting there, uh, but you'll have a split second to make a decision about whether you're going to do something, whether you're going to sit tight, maybe look the other way, look out the window of your train or your bus. You have a split second to decide whether you should stand up and approach the people involved in the altercation and decide which words you may want to use. You have a split second to work out what the consequences of intervening may involve. And I think it's only natural that we go through this calculation in our minds. And for many of us, we will have a natural apprehension of what may happen if we do take a step forward and be confronted by physical violence. That is at the back of our minds. You know, what happens if this person should start turning their attention on, on me or on you? What should happen if this person, and who knows, if this person could be on uh, some substance, could be prone to violence, may have a knife in their pocket. You never know. What happens if they turn their violent intention on, on you. 
Psychologists have, have long pondered the, the situation of the bystander. In the 1970s, there was a notorious case involving a woman by the name of Kitty Genovese in New York City. Kitty Genovese was murdered in New York City, but as she faced her, her death, she screamed out for help. It was in a New York street uh, during the day, and there were more than 30 people who heard her cries for help. Not one of those 30-odd people did anything. No one reported uh, the cries for help to police. No one stepped in. No one intervened. Psychologists have referred to, to this example as an illustration of how difficult it can be to get people to, to respond to a, to a situation of impending violence or abuse. In the work that, that we do at the Australian Human Rights Commission, particularly through our Racism It Stops With Me public awareness campaign, uh, we encourage people to reflect on what they can do in those situations. There's always something that you can do. Yes, you can intervene if you think it's safe to do so. You can always say something. But if you don't, you can always report something. You can always have a word with your bus driver or say something to uh, a train station attendant. You can report something to the police or you can lodge a complaint with the Australian Human Rights Commission if it's appropriate. And perhaps most importantly, you can always offer your moral solidarity or support to a target or victim of abuse. Uh, this is perhaps one overlooked action that people, or intervention that people can make. The research indicates that when someone engages in a public act of racist abuse or harassment, uh, in their head they in fact believe that the majority of those around them support or endorse their action. So it's a powerful uh, statement of repudiation if you say no. You can challenge that person and show them that their behaviour is in fact something that is not endorsed by the majority of those around them. Let me say something now about the, the threats to racial tolerance in Australia today. If we're considering threats to, to racial tolerance, one obvious place to start is to look at the sources of racial prejudice and discrimination. What are the sources of racial prejudice and discrimination? Quite often it's said that racism is a product of fear and hatred. In part this is because racism has been traditionally defined in that Oxford English Dictionary way. If you are to open the dictionary and look up the meaning of, of, of racism, you'll find something along the lines of uh, a belief in the superiority of one or more races over others, or a, or a doctrine of racial superiority. You may think of extremist, racist, organised movements. Um, think of, I don't know, the, the Ku Klux Klan, or something of that sort. Very nasty, very ugly, quite doctrinaire. This is a very narrow definition of racism uh, for the simple reason that you don't need to be a card-carrying member of the Ku Klux Klan to say or do something with racist implications. Uh, I think there are many other sources of racial prejudice and discrimination that we should recognise. Yes, fear and hatred can animate racism, but so can envy and resentment. We know, for example, that when economies deteriorate, when unemployment increases, uh, those of ethnic or cultural minority background uh, can be identified as scapegoats. Uh, we know, uh, for example, that if uh, there is a perception that some groups may uh, enjoy special privileges, this is, you know, the perception may be, be right, quite often it's wrong, uh, this can also lead to expressions of prejudice and discrimination. 
I think, uh, for example, of the envy that is uh, often directed at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, people, often out of a mistaken belief that, uh, that they enjoy special entitlements that are not given uh, to others. I think of the uh, envy that was directed uh, and, uh, at Asian immigrants uh, in the 1980s and 90s following debates sparked by Geoffrey Blaney and then opposition leader John Howard. Um, there's also the problem of moral arrogance. What do I mean by this? Uh, I, I'm referring uh, here to, to those who respond to debates about racism by saying, I'm not racist, or by saying that something is not truly racist. Uh, there was a, an article uh, recently, in the last month or so, in the Sydney Morning Herald, where an opinion writer said that, uh, uh, that racism isn't truly racism uh, unless it involved extreme forms of doctrine. Uh, that if there were so-called racist incidents, it may be best to label them as merely stupid incidents or as acts of stupidity or misguided sentiment rather than as racist incidents. And I, and I find this a very curious phenomenon. Um, it's a semantic uh, exercise, uh, but I find it interesting that such a semantic exercise is uh, not always conducted when it comes to antisocial behaviour. So the distinction between racist behaviour and racism, you know, one isn't a racist, even if one can engage in racist behaviour, there's a difference. Uh, we don't seem to make the distinction, do we, when it comes to criminal behaviour or criminals? Uh, where, do we draw the, where, where do we make the distinction and say that someone is not actually a criminal but is just someone who has engaged in criminal behaviour? It's a distinction that isn't made. And I think this, this points to, to something in moral sensibilities concerning uh, race. And quite often it's because there's a defensiveness around race. The word conjures, uh, because of that Oxford English Dictionary definition, the image of the doctrinaire bigot. People will never think of themselves as being uh, racist. But yet there's a phenomenon uh, referred to uh, as, as casual racism which embodies many of the evils of contemporary prejudice and discrimination today. Uh, people can make jokes, people can make offhanded comments that have the effect of belittling or denigrating someone on the basis of race even if the person delivering those remarks may not be a subscriber to David Duke's ideas of racial superiority. Racism, at the end of the day, is as much about impact as it is about intention. In terms of threats, so I've gone through a few so far, fear and hatred, envy and resentment, moral arrogance. I think there are two... Uh, to, to social threats as opposed to attitudinal uh, threats that we should bear in mind. Now, one concerns technology and the development of technology. Uh, when it comes to racism today, a lot of it has, been, has migrated to the online sphere, whereas once racial abuse was something that you would see in the public square, in physical form, Increasingly, you are seeing it expressed in electronic form, in, in cyberspace. Uh, last year, for example, the Australian Human Rights Commission received a 59% increase, 59% increase in the number of racial hatred and vilification complaints. Uh, a lot of this is attributable to complaints concerning social networking sites and video sharing sites. Uh, I believe this is a particular generational challenge when it comes to racial tolerance. Uh, the last thing you would want to do is to undo the gains that have been made in previous generations by encouraging uh, people to believe that behaviour online is somehow exempt 
from the ordinary standards of acceptable behaviour. There's also a social threat to racial tolerance in the debates that we have uh, in public. Uh, now, I've, I've given you two sources of uh, evidence about the, the rise in racism. Uh, the Scanlon Foundation survey finding uh, and our own commission experience when it comes to, to racial hatred complaints. Now, I have no doubt that the uh, debate that we have had on asylum seekers and refugees has had a deleterious effect uh, on racial tolerance. When you demonise uh, people who, who come as asylum seekers, unfortunately this can spill over into our social cohesion and race relations more generally. For the simple reason that not everyone can make or is willing to make a distinction between an asylum seeker, a refugee, an international student, a first generation Australian, or even an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. I've had people tell me uh, of, uh, of their experience uh, as an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person being told to go back to where they came from. That's an illustration of the uh, generalised hostility uh, that debates around issues like asylum uh, seekers can have. So how do we combat these threats to racial tolerance? And it's on this note that I'll conclude my remarks. I believe it's fundamentally important to have an unambiguous response to racial prejudice and discrimination. A big part of this will involve having laws that will send a signal about what is acceptable civil behaviour. As you'll be aware, there has been intense public debate about the Racial Discrimination Act during the past year or so. The federal government has proposed a repeal of sections 18C and D of the Act, which cover racial vilification in public. A lot of this has been justified by the decision of the federal uh, court in the case involving Harold's son, columnist Andrew Bolt, a case where Mr. Bolt wrote a series of articles about fair-skinned Aboriginal people and was found to have contravened the Racial Discrimination Act, which prohibits anything that is done in public which offends, insults, humiliates or intimidates another person on the grounds of race or ethnicity. It's not often mentioned in the debate that this section of the Act is accompanied by Section 18D, which states that anything that is done in the course of artistic work, scientific or academic inquiry, or fair comment or fair reporting on a matter of public interest is protected speech, provided that you act reasonably and in good faith. Now, these laws have existed for almost 20 years. They were a response to a number of systemic inquiries and reports which recommended the introduction of remedies for racial abuse and harassment in public places. The Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, the National Inquiry into Racist Violence conducted by the then Race Discrimination Commissioner Irene Moss, the recommendations of the Australian Law Reform Commission. Uh, I believe it is important for us to debate the limits of, of free speech, uh, but if there is to be a case made for changing the law, then this should be preceded by a systemic inquiry or, uh, or other equivalent efforts uh, before a case for reform is made. Uh, I do not believe that any such effort has been made and I see no compelling reason for us to be changing laws which enjoy widespread public acceptance and have done so for almost two decades. A poll earlier this year by Fairfax Nielsen showed that 88% of people believed it should remain unlawful to, uh, to, uh, uh, to insult, uh, humiliate uh, or intimidate on the grounds uh, of race. Uh, and the law should send a powerful signal about racial vilification because when racial vilification happens, it diminishes the freedom and dignity of those who are on the receiving end. In any case, we have all sorts of laws that currently restrict 
freedom of speech. Freedom of speech has never been something absolute. If you look at our, it's not just laws, it's also instruments and regulations. If you look at our parliamentary standing orders that our politicians adhere to in state and federal parliaments, for example, they are prevented from using offensive language in parliament. If they use offensive language, they have to withdraw. We have criminal summary offence laws in most state jurisdictions that mean that you can be convicted of using offensive language in a public place. 12,000 people, in fact, were convicted of this in New South Wales alone last year. We also have laws concerning defamation, which prevent people from offending another person's reputation in public. Uh, recently, there was a, a, a case uh, that um, involving the, the Roco Coco restaurant, now defunct uh, on King Street Wharf and has been the subject of long uh, litigation which um, saw damages of $600,000 awarded because of a restaurant review which said Roco Coco uh, had a chicken dish that was outstandingly dull. $600,000. Uh, Ray Hadley of 2UE Radio uh, Station had to pay damages of two. $188,000 for calling a woman a vile grub or a silly woman and, and a grub. $288,000 for that. Uh, my question is this. Uh, to those who are proposing changes to, to the law, uh, if we accept that our elected representatives should refrain from using offensive language, if we accept that you can be convicted for using offensive language in a public place, if we accept that you can pay six-figure damages for offending someone's reputation in public, then why isn't it also reasonable that you can be held accountable for racially abusing and harassing someone in public? The law, of course, is not the only response that you can offer to racism. Um, you can't legislate for change attitudes and behaviour. But it shouldn't be a case of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, and you shouldn't be waiting until a society is virtuous until you begin to have legislation about acceptable standards of behaviour. Our laws, as much as anything else, reflect our aspirations and express our values as our society. And if we value civility, decency and respect, then I believe it's perfectly right and acceptable to have laws against racial vilification. I'll end on that note, but I hope that gives you uh, some sense of how interventions and intersections uh, indeed animate uh, the work not only of, uh, of scholars and academics and researchers, but uh, also uh, those of us uh, who are in the, the field of, of human rights. And I look forward to a to a discussion with you on these matters and, and wish you the very best for your deliberations in the next few days.